we are going to talk about a couple big names that have a lot of news circulating around them. And we're going to start with Jonathan Taylor, who obviously is going on the pup list for the first four weeks. He's been back and forth with Ursay all off season about his contract situation. We don't know if he's going to play, when he's going to play, what team he's going to play for. So I guess I'll start the conversation off with, what exactly is it we should be doing with Jonathan Taylor in Dynasty? If you're a manager who is expecting to use him to win right now, what would you be looking to do? And are you comfortable holding or moving off of him, Matt? Uh, if I if I was a Jonathan Taylor manager, and I am on a, a few contenders, this is not the time to sell. It's not the time to panic. It's the time to be on the other side of it. Uh, you know, four weeks could end up being a year. We don't know. But... You can always fill in. And the thing is, if you're play, if you are so shallow at the running back position that you can't compete for four weeks without Jonathan Taylor, then you're not competing for the other uh, 13 weeks. It's not, it's not happening. If you're not ready to compete without Jonathan Taylor, you don't deserve him. No, I'm right there with you. Like, there's a lot of guys that through the entire offseason where you could get thrown into trades, guys like Samaj P. Ryan, um, you know, guys like Jamal Williams, where they cost maybe, uh, maybe a second and you get a third back with them, maybe a third. And these types of players should be good enough fills, at least for that first month. And I completely agree. If you cannot survive a month without Jonathan Taylor, you're not exactly where you thought you were. Now, this is the typically the type of situation where I like to swoop in and see if a manager really is uneasy because Jonathan Taylor at the end of the day, he's not even 25 years old. He's going to get a contract with someone at some point, and we know just how darn talented Jonathan Taylor is. We know that he can be a running back one for a couple more seasons. And with Jonathan Taylor, I still view him right there as like RB5 type in Dynasty. He's right there. He shouldn't really be moving down anyone's rankings. And Right now, I mean, if people really want to move, you know, Nick Chubb, Tony Pollard, um, then I'm I'm totally cool going and swooping in and getting Jonathan Taylor. Honestly, I'd be thrown out first just as a starting point as a conversation, especially if I am a competing team and I expect that to be a little later because Jonathan Taylor can end up being that punch down the line that really does put me over the top. And if he doesn't come in and give me that punch over the top, well, I got a back that I expect to be a running back one for at least another season or two for a first, which seems a better use of your first than going out and using the first. Even if I have to put a little bit more on it, I think that's a good starting point in a conversation. That's a great point. And what you said about the down the stretch thing, uh, in Dynasty, you should always play for down the stretch because down the stretch is just a microcosm of what we're doing in Dynasty altogether. And if you want Jonathan Taylor on your team for he's gonna be a he's gonna be an effective tool for the next three years at least, even in this weird running back market. So if you're if you're playing for down the stretch, he's a perfect person to go for. And there are a few more. You, you were talking about uh, Cup earlier, but I'm, I am excited to go send out some offers for Jonathan Taylor. And a, a first is a nice place to start. What running backs would you send straight up? What I send straight up? I would send Nick Chubb. I would send Tony Pollard. I would uh, basically anyone who's not Bijan Robinson, Brees Hall, Christian McCaffrey, or probably not Jameer Gibbs at this exact moment. I think Saquon Barkley or Jonathan Taylor's rate amount that, that, that question point that I think is really worth having a conversation, but I'd rather have him over Travis Etienne, Josh Jacobs, Kenneth Walker, um, Austin Eckler, even Austin Eckler as well. So wow. I think, I think that's where I sit on Jonathan Taylor. And if you do have a team right now that is competing, let's say you do have, you know, three backs that are very capable, three potential RB ones and Jonathan Taylor, but maybe your QB two spot is like a, you know, a Desmond Ritter or a, a Jordan Love, or you're sitting with a really, really tougher spot down the line, maybe a Mac Jones as you QB2. I would be fine with moving Jonathan Taylor for like a two attack of I lower or something around that or a Dak Prescott. If that is on the table for a manager, I'm very, very content because I think the insulated value around the quarterback position is, is a fine move off and it fills an exact need you have. I think that would make you a better team now and you keep that total uh, value on your roster thereafter. So I, even though you know, a year from now, you might think you lost maybe a third or so worth of value. You also got rid of the headache for that third and supplementing your lineup with a better piece for your team. So I think if you are in that situation where you're competing, you have the depth and you need a quarterback, that's like probably a move I would go out and make as well. Now, some of you guys aren't necessarily competing or winning, and you might have Jonathan Taylor on a team that is maybe middle of the pack or you're learning, leaning towards that rebuild situation. And there, 
I can completely justify moving him for the tier of wider series. That's like T Higgins, Devonta Smith, DK Metcalf, Drake one and Jack Smith and Jigba. I think if you wanted to mitigate risk, get off the headache, pick up a wide receiver that you think will be potentially a cornerstone for your team and, you know, get off a of Jonathan Taylor that way. I think that's the type of deal that would make sense for two different parties, right? Uh, a competitor for all the reasons we just talked about picks up Jonathan Taylor to potentially bolster his lineup down the line. And you picked up a potential cornerstone wide receiver. I think that is fair. Like the value again, a year from now might seem like you lost a little bit, but you gained potentially the more uh, long-term asset and you got rid of the headache. And I don't think they're far enough off where it's like, I'm going to lose sleep about it. So that's the only thing I would say, if you're not competing, I would be totally cool moving into that tier wide receiver uh, through Jonathan Taylor. And, you know, you're right that a third isn't really much at at the end of the day. And there's a few, there's a few, uh, you know, now versus later things that you could do. There's some really good old wide receivers that I don't want on my team, but I don't really know that I can find a buyer for them, but Jonathan Taylor manager creates a great buyer. You know, if you needed a, uh, an Amari Cooper, you, you can do Jonathan Taylor and then replace him with a pick plus Amari Cooper or something like that. You know, one of these older guys, Mike Evans, if you're confident in him, there's a, a few other, you know, Tyler Lockett's in the game. Um, a few names that you said that I thought were really interesting were Tony Pollard and Jamal Williams, as far as arbitraging either way, Tony Pollard is a really interesting one because we don't, are you are we sure that he's going to come back healthy and take a workload? He did snap his shin in the playoffs down the run, didn't he? So how how sure are we that he's going to come back strong early? Yeah, I'm pretty confident that a team that is currently deploying Rico Dowdle, uh, they've got Ronald Jones on the suspension list, and they have all four foot twelve with Deuce Vaughn. I'm very confident that that team uh, is is pretty cool with the situation Tony Pollard falls in. I think his workload is going to be great. I think he's an RB1. I think in your redraft league, he's a top 24 pick. I don't have any really any concerns with Tony Pollard. It's just more so the type of back Tony Pollard is versus the type of back that Jonathan Taylor is. My concerns for for Pollard long-term still fall within, is he the type of back who's going to get 20 carries, 20 touches a game? I do not believe so. He's a hyper-efficient player. His volume this year might boost up but he's only had a handful of games in his career that he's gone over 12 12 opportunities or 12 carries uh, it's it's only been like 12 games in his entire career so uh i'm just that's my only concern with tony Pollard. i still think he's he's going to be an rb1 this season but long term jonathan taylor is just much more the back i want the only pushback i could give you on the take about amari cooper and mike evans plus a pick is you got to think of the type of manager that's moving amari cooper and mike evans for jonathan taylor if they are more rebuilding they're probably not giving you picks with them. And if they are competing, I don't think that most managers are going to be a situation where they can take on Taylor and they probably need Amari Cooper and Mike Evans to be that wide receiver two or wide receiver three or flex for their lineups. So that's the only thing where it's kind of tough, like in a vacuum, I completely agree, but we're at that point in the season where the redraft mindset really starts to crawl in. Managers are looking at their lineups. They have to set a lineup. They're looking at projected points and everything like that. So it's just something at this point in the year, people really do got to take into consideration. Now, 